निहयर हार माधवा कुंज
Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Canto 7, Chapter 15, Text 71, Instructions for Civilized Human Beings. Ekada Deva Satra Tu Gandharva Sarasam Ganaha Upahuta Vishva Srigbabir Hari Gato Pagayane Ekada Deva Satru Ekada Deva Satre Tu Gandharvapsarasam Ganaha Upahuta Vishwag Srigbir Harigato Paganyane Ekada Deva Satre Tu Gandharva Saprasam Ganaha Upahuta Vishwa Srigbir Harigato Pagayane Ekada. Once upon a time, Devasatre, in the assembly of the demigods, two, indeed, Gandharva, of the inhabitants of Gandharva Loka, Apsarasam, and the inhabitants of Apsara Loka. Gana, all, Upahuta, were invited, Vishwasrigbir, by the great demigods known as the Prajapatis, Harigata Upaganye Gayane, on the occasion of Kirtan for the glorifying the Supreme Lord. Translation. Now this is uh, 
uh, Narada Muni speaking about his previous life and how he was a, in the assembly of demigods, he was a Gandharva. Once there was a Sankirtan festival to glorify the Supreme Lord in the assembly of the demigods. And the Gadaras and the Apsaras were invited by the Prajapatis to take part in it. Hmm. Purport, Prabhupada's purport is quite interesting. Sankirtan means chanting of the holy name of the Lord. The Hare Krishna movement is not a new movement as people sometimes mistakenly think. The Hare Krishna movement is present in every millennium of Lord Brahma's life. And the holy name is chanted in all of higher planetary systems, including Brahma Loka and Chandra Loka, not to speak of Gandharva Loka and Apsara Loka. The Sankirtan movement that was started in this world 500 years ago by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is therefore not a new movement. Sometimes, because of our bad luck, this movement is stopped. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his servants again start the movement for the benefit of the entire world, or indeed, the entire universe. Om Agyan Timidandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Un Militam Yena Tas Mai Sri Gurave Maha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stap Ditam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kedam Mayam Dadati Swapadantikam Dama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vrata Shamiti Namine Namaste Sarasari Devi Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavari Pasyatyare Satarine Panchakalpa Tarubhishya Kripa Sindhu Pebhacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Nave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasri Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. The word uh, Sankirtan has two meanings. When we are pretty much commonly known as to come together to glorify the Lord. But it has another meaning also. Uh, I'll go back another step. The word Kirtan comes from the etymological root word known as kirti and the word kirti means fame so kirtan means to glorify the all famous personality of godhead <laughs> and sankirtan means together but then san also has another meaning it means complete there is no more complete way perfect way to glorify the lord than by Sankirtan. <laughs> Coming together to glorify the Lord by chanting His glories. <laughs> and there's another meaning that we can also apply to those who perform Sankirtan. Those who actually perform Sankirtan are also considered to be glorious. <laughs> so there's many ways you can look at this particular terminology. Here, as Prabhupada also indicates that this sankirtan is something that is eternal. It's been going on from time immemorial. And here we see about an incident that happened, oh, like you might say millions of years ago by our calculation. In the heavenly planets, the Prajapatis decided to invite people from other heavenly planets to have a festival to glorify the Lord. And people came from Gandharva Loka, Chandra Loka, Apsara Loka, Brahma Loka, all came together. And Narada Muni Upabanhana, Upa in his previous life, was a Gandharva. And he, ha he was very beautiful, <laughs> and he also had a very beautiful voice. And so singing in the assembly of all these great personalities, he deviated from the from focus. Instead of singing the glories of the Lord, he started to sing the glories of the demigods. <laughs> and that became a point of contention, and not contention, but everybody 
was unhappy, and therefore some of the key demigods decided to correct him in such a strong way that they actually cursed him that in his next life he would be a sudra and he wouldn't be so attractive. <laughs> so that was a big offense when you're, one is there glorifying the Lord and shifting it to the demigods. Because Krishna says in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, one who worships the demigods are actually hita mm -hmm. and their intelligence is stunted. They are removed from good intelligence. As Prabhupada says, Alpamedasa, that, that brain substance that is more like cow dung. <laughs> so this, is, this was a great offense, and therefore he had to fall. Now he's describing. And it says it's interesting because he was able to remember his, way, his pre previous life and then how he fell from that more elevated position and he had to come down to the earth planet. And then again, work his way up. But then again, you see, when you're, when you're cursed by great souls, there's always some benediction within the curse. You saw that with Nalakuvera and Mani Griva, how they were cursed by Narada Muni for walking around like trees, and then they became trees. But they became trees in such a place that they had the, got the darshan of the Supreme Personality of Godhead personally, and was be able to become purified by that darshan. So there was a obviously a benediction, and this is how great souls curse. They don't simply punish, but they punish in such a way. You see also when uh, Garuda was chasing uh, Kaliya out of the ocean because Kaliya was eating the fish that <laughs> Garuda was, was supposed to get, and. Uh, yeah, he cursed him, and he, well, he actually tried to, you know, finish him off. But that, he wound up meeting Krishna in Vrindavan, and he became purified because Krishna danced on his head. He had to go through some trials and tribulations, and undergo some difficulties and a lot of suffering. But still, ultimately, the benediction was there that he actually got the dust of the lotus feet of the Lord directly placed upon his head. So we see how um, great souls, when they curse, there's only some uh, underlying benefit. It stops the person, just like when Krishna kills demons, he kills the demons to stop their demoniac, nefarious activities, but they get purified, and they get elevated to some form of liberation. You see Suhuja Mukti. But obviously, it's much better than what they were, being de demons causing trouble to themselves and others. Hmm. So this is how we, see, we can see this particular situation. It was a benediction in disguise. And then, of course, Prabhupada mentions in the previous verse how he took birth as a son of Lord Brahma, <laughs> eventually. So that's a very elevated birth. So, and mistakes in devotional service do have reactions, but ultimately there are some good uh, future uh, benefits that fall upon the person who accepts it and then goes on in their devotional life. Here Prabhupada wants to make a point that this Sankirtan movement is not something that we just began, you know, how many years ago? Maybe 50 some years ago. And people think, oh, this is something new, a new movement. When our movement started in the West, people, we were categorized as a new religious movement. And it wasn't until the court case in New York on May, March 18, 1977, that the High Supreme Court of the State of New York actually researched the judges researched the history of our movement and gave us credit for, their, for our real credentials, saying that actually this is a bona fide, time-old religious movement that goes back many thousands of years. And when Prabhupada heard that statement, this was in, in relationship to a brainwashing case that we were being persecuted for, or not persecuted, but actually tried for, 
and the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court of New York, and uh, we got credit. And Prabhupada said, now, after he heard that, he said, now my movement has become successful. Endorsement from such a high position within the secular society. And, that, and then, of course, that was only maybe six months, seven months, eight months before Prabhupada left the planet. But that endorsement is still there. People sometimes ask us, you know, is your movement, what is, your, what is the history of your movement? What is the credentials of your movement? What is, we, we point to that particular statement made by Judge Leahy, Leahy, L-E-A-H-Y, and he uh, made a very elaborate and very detailed statement giving credit to our movement. It's not something new and is bona fide and it is time traditional. So that was a great credit for our movement. So Prabhupada here, of course, is saying the same thing, that our movement is not something new as people mistakenly think. It's, it's an old movement. Even after Lord Chaitanya came, it was stopped. After Lord Chaitanya disappeared from the planet, there was a gap of about 150 years where the Sankirtan movement was stopped. And that's a long story, and that was, had to do with the curse of uh, Sukaracharya in relationship to Vamana Dev. And that was an interesting sta uh, story. I don't know the details of the story, but our movement was stopped for that time. And then, of course, it was again revived by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, and then, of course, he continued on with Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. And then, of course, Srila Prabhupada. And so, this movement is an eternal movement. It can't be stopped by the outside. Sometimes people think, you know, just like now, they're trying to put restrictions in all areas of, of life to stop social activities, group gatherings, various types of ways that people are accustomed to come together for various ceremonies and other social events. But, you know, now uh, devotees are still going out in the streets. Of course, some places are still somewhat deficient in understanding that it's not a problem to get out there and start chanting and dancing again. I just received a series of pictures along with a video yesterday from one disciple showing the New York Rathiyatra, which went on last weekend. And uh, devotees were out there chanting and dancing. Uh, of course, it was only one cart. It wasn't three carts like we usually have, three huge carts. There was only one. But still, the devotees were out there, and it was a good crowd. And, and Mahavishnu Swami was leading the kirtan. <laughs> oh, it's like, you, you know, it's like two things that cannot be separated. <laughs> Him and his hat. <laughs> You're going to see him this weekend. He's going to be the Rieka <laughs> with his hat. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. He's coming, yeah. Along with uh, three others, five sannyasis this weekend are going to be there. Yeah. Kadambakana Maharaj, Bhakti Ananda Goswami Maharaj, four and a half sannyasis, Prahladananda Maharaj, Vishnu. Mahavishnu Swami and somebody else. And <laughs> <laughs> so devotees are again taking to the streets and taking part in the more festive type of preaching that we uh, are accustomed to doing. And this is a good sign. We want to keep it going to and move it along. And that will inspire the devotees, other devotees, to get back into it again. And maybe in a, in a better way than we had done before. So we, this movement cannot be stopped. Sometimes we think, you know, by uh, that the demons can stop this movement. But Prabhupada always said many times, they will try, but they can never succeed. Because it's ordained by Lord Chaitanya. And, even, and here it says, Prabhupada said, because of our bad luck, sometimes, because of our bad luck, this movement was stopped. But then again, Lord Chaitanya's servants and him again started the movement. 
So just say it stopped again for whatever reason. It'll be again restarted by Lord Chaitanya's servants again. It can never be stopped. It's an eternal movement. And it's meant and is ordained by the Lord to change the entire face of the world and bring real spirituality onto the globe of this world. The way it looks like now, you can't really see it. <laughs> There's indications that things are happening, but still at the same time we have the words of the acharyas and the words of the lord himself you know when uh chan kasi tried to stop the sankirtan movement many hundreds of years ago and when lord chaitanya was present uh lord chaitanya was like nishringadev <laughs> in fact lord nishringadev appeared <laughs> in that particular pastime to let you know chan kasi know that you know, you don't mess with my devotees, you know. <laughs> you don't try to stop my movement. And uh, Chan Kazi got the message, <laughs> really quite direct. So this is the same, so Lord Chaitanya, I mean, he organized Harinam Sankirtan in such a powerful way that millions, not just thousands, millions of living beings appeared from all places in the universe to take part. And this is also true, that our movement now, when we do programs, if it's grand and very special programs, the demigods come, but they come in disguise. We don't know them. They might look like just another part, person in the, in the assembly. So they actually take part. In fact, it says when, there's, when there is a fenceless Harinam, Lord Chaitanya personally appears in that kirtan. Personally, of course, he did that with Naratam Das Thakur. When Naratam was in the Kateri Gam festival, along with many great souls, it was 550 enough for 50 years after the disappearance of Lord Chaitanya. When he was leading Kirtan, Lord Chaitanya and the Panchatattva and many of the disappeared uh, devotees of Lord Chaitanya appeared to take part in that Sankirtan, and everybody saw them. But the Lord is also appearing, and his devotees are also appearing in these kirtans. Just like when Prabhupada uh, had a program in New York, and devotees, and this was in back in 1966, 65, 66, something like that. Uh, devotees wanted to make Prabhupada's, and Prabhupada public. So they had hired in this hall, which had many hundreds of seats in it. They put posters all over New York City, you know, at least in one area of New York City, advertising the Swami from India, which some, you know, is going to teach the science of bhakti yoga. And uh, so they advertised as much as they could. But when it, the event actually came, only seven people came. <laughs> and so, the devotees were feeling unhappy that they failed. You know, only seven people came. And so at the end, they expressed their unhappiness to Srila Prabhupada. And he said, no, actually, you, you didn't see Narada Muni. He was here. <laughs> Narada Muni was here. Somebody also said that, a few people said that during the opening of the palace in New Vrindavan also. <laughs> And many great personalities appeared for that particular opening of the palace in 1979 in New Vrindavan. And every uh, person who was in the position of guru at that time appeared for that opening. All the 11 gurus, well, I think it was nine at the time, or maybe it was 11. It was 11, yeah. Were you there also? Did you come for that opening? Yeah. I wasn't even there, it was my birthday actually, and that was the opening day, it was my birthday, but I was, I had to stay back and do puja that day. <laughs> yeah, I wrote the article that guy had. He wrote that article, oh nice. And the, yeah, so that's, uh, I guess it's in that same area, 1979, yeah. Yeah, that was a grand festival, and many people said it was quite mystical, the whole atmosphere during that time. So this Sankirtan movement is, you know, it's, uh, it's Lord Chaitanya's personal movement and it will go on. So devotees, 
But Prabhupada said it can be stopped if we if we become insincere. If we become insincere, it'll be stopped, and then it will have to be revived again. So we always remain sincere. What does that mean? He said, be very strict in following the principles and chanting every day your 16 rounds. That strictness is actually the foundation for us to remain enthusiastic in Krishna consciousness. Sometimes devotees, after many years, for whatever reason, start to minimize the importance of chanting rounds. And for other whatever reason, they and now we've seen that even in the early days, there were devotees who had many, many responsibilities with services. And jai, shi shi pancha tattva ki jai. And uh, they decreased their rounds, and, and even some cases stopped chanting so they could do their services. I don't want to name anybody, but the, the, that was there a few times in our early days, and Prabhupada reacted differently to that situation. But in general, if you see how the situation is being understood through Prabhupada's words and through his uh, books, you see that he emphasized the importance of staying very strict and chanting 16 rounds and chanting and following these four regulative principles. He said, actually, if you do it your whole life, he said, you could go back home, back to Godhead, simply by this alone. So it's, a, it's, it's the foundation. And this is what keeps our movement strong. There have been many attempts to minimize these principles and change them and kind of lower the standard. But because Prabhupada could foresee that this may also happen, he was very strong and making these statements so we wouldn't be victimized by, you know, trying to change things around. I saw that happen in the New Vrindavan community where it wasn't 16 rounds anymore, it was two hours of japa. We actually came to the point, if you chant two hours, then that is considered to be sufficient like that. And some people could chant 16 rounds in two hours and others could not. But two hours was all was was considered to be a new standard, <laughs> a new standard, and uh, not only that, we were supposed to chant uh, silently, manasi japa, in the mind, and so that became a, a feature, and we ta we turned the temple into a Christian church. <laughs> And the lights were low. There were no lights in the temple. Everything was dark. We had little votive candles placed along the columns. So people were sitting in chairs. And once in a while you would hear <laughs> And that was part of the japa. Somewhere in between the Hari and the Rama. It was <laughs> Only the ones who were awake heard it. <laughs> When we first heard about that, we thought, oh, wow, this sounds like a real interesting and very novel way to improve our chanting. And the immediate reaction from the assembly of devotees is, wow, this is better. I'm chanting better rounds. That was only lasted for a few weeks. <laughs> and then finally, after it was all exposed as being bogus, we finally came across a statement by Srila Prabhupada saying, one should not sit in the dark and try to chant silently. <laughs> it was just some off-the-cuff statement Prabhupada made, I guess, in, in, with a group of devotees. It wasn't recorded, <laughs> but he did say it. Yeah, not loud to hear. And Prabhupada also says that when, if you're disturbed, and most of us are, <laughs> he said, chant loudly. He Prabhupada said, even I, when uh, I get, when I become disturbed, you know, sometimes Prabhupada had to manage the whole society, and it was sometimes it was bothering him when, with all the problems the society was going on, and it was up to him to solve the problem. So Prabhupada sometimes would you know, vo voice that and say, you know, try to manage this society so I can do the books. 
But then he would say, you know, when I get like that, I chant loudly. <laughs> I chant loudly. He said, when you chant loudly, ghosts, demons, and disturbances all go. <laughs> they all run away, far away, like that. So all loudly could be determined by how best you can hear. That's the... You should see, you should hear nicely. So if you're not hearing nicely, maybe you haven't cleaned your ears in the last five weeks or something. <laughs> and so you might have to chant a little bit louder to get through all that debris that's there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so th therefore, you know, we should definitely have to emphasize this importance of hearing very nicely. But we should understand, and this is a very important verse, that this movement can be stopped. The Prabhupada said only by, from within. If our society starts to go like, like Prabhupada said, we are not a, simply a comfortable society. We have our temples, we have our worship, we have our prasadam. We do our little festivals, we're happy, everybody smiles at each other, thanks each other, goes home and watches television. That's not our move. Our movement is to expand. That means we always have to be in that move, how to increase this movement, how to bring more souls in and how to increase the quality of whatever we're doing. It's always in the mood of expansion. And that's what keeps the movement vibrant. Because if we don't have that mood of mood of expansion, we will get complacent, get ordinary, we get mundane, we start bringing in material principles and thinking they're spiritual. You know, good material principles to help improve the quality of our, you know, the way we do things. Rather than keeping the focus on the essence, and that is hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord and preaching. Harinam Sankirtan. And of course, uh, see, she's okay, she can stay. <laughs> you can go, but she can stay. <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> she wants to say something to Avaduta, but Okay, so yeah, this is so our this this process of chanting and dancing and distributing prasadam. You see, every time, just like last night, we had a program here. Twenty plus people came for the program. What did we do? We had discussions, we had chanting, and we gave prasadam. That's our power. That's what attracts people, and that's what that's what gives our movement life. We emphasize that. And of course, whatever else we're doing, we should also do it in the best possible way. Deity worship and organ organizing our devotees in such a way that we can maximize the amount of energy and time to move devotees along in their Krishna consciousness. So there's many emphasis, but it all centers around hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Okay, so we'll stop there. I don't know if there's any questions, but we'll just ask and just in case. <laughs> any questions? There's always one question from Roy. Is it in English? Oh, English, actually. He actually wrote me on my email, too. <laughs> Hare Krishna. I thought the lecture on will be on Sloka 70. Perhaps it was not given for public. But I have a few questions on the topic of the previous sloka. Okay, I happen to have it right here. <laughs> in Srimad Bhagavatam 7.12, woman is compared to fire and man, and the word pramada is there as well, which can also mean mad. Can we compare women to madness? It makes man mad of lust. So what, is there a question or is this that just a statement? It's a question. What is the question? So women is compared to fire. Right. Man is compared and to fire. The butter. word the mud is, is there as well. It can mean mad. In other words, can we compare women to madness? Mad. Which, which makes man mad of lust. Somebody's just playing with words. 
Okay. Second question. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, Prabhupada never said women were mada. He said, they, you know, he gave, he gave them credit, but he also said they were like butter. No, like they're, fire. They're, they're like fire. Fire. And men are like butter. You come together and melt. And they do, they can make men mad unless you chant Hare Krishna. And then you, be, then you don't become mad for them. You become mad for Krishna. Why in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, the women is compared, considered to be only half a soul? Like, for example, Lord Chaitanya had three and a half confidential associates. The half refers to Madhavi Devi. Right. Okay. I think you should ask Lord Chaitanya for the answer. <laughs> I'm sure he can give you a better answer than I could. Um, there's no purport explanation given anywhere that I know of, just to qualify it, about why that statement is made in that, in that way. Yeah, yeah, the Sikhi Mahiti, Srup Damodar Goswami, and Ramananda Roy were the three. Sikhi Mihiti's sister was Madhavi Devi. <laughs> so you might say, I don't know, I, I, I don't want to speculate because it doesn't, no, all the speculations, it's, it's all speculation. So um, I can't really give an answer to that unless somebody else wants to try. Maharaj, you want to try that one? <laughs> well, these are Krishna's, Lord Chaitanya's confidential associates. Right. So, externally, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't associate with women. Mm. He, he avoided it. Therefore, although she was, obviously, it didn't matter whether you were in a man or female body in terms of being a confidential associate, like Janavi Devi right. was the acharya of our society. So it didn't matter that Madhava Devi was in a woman's body. There was no qualification. But because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's associates, she had to have some distinction being a woman because he, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a sannyasi, and therefore she couldn't be included as a full associate, but as a half associate. Oh, half associate. Oh, very good explanation, yeah. <laughs> makes complete sense half is you know. and there's no really any written uh, account of that association either <laughs> anything else uh, uh, thank you for inspiring lecture um, could I please um, could I please ask um, why is there a tendency in us to um, change the standard and why is there a tendency in us um, not to be sincere and how to check that tendency? Well, Prabhupada said he made a statement: "Walk on your hands, whatever you do, change." He said that's the disease of your Westerners, but that's a disease now everywhere. Change. Because change kind of gives you a feeling that there's something better. It may not be better, but it gives you that feeling of something better. So that's just a, a tendency, because from the material point of view, when you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you get bored and tired of it. But spirituality is different. There's no need for change, because everything spiritual is unlimited. And therefore, you can you can go deeper into whatever you're doing by doing it better, by doing it more, by doing more offering, by doing it better. And Prabhupada also said that too, in terms of our movement. He says that this movement simply means to practice. Practice what I gave you, and as you practice, you become more proficient. Like that. But the tendency is for those who are you know, can't understand the nature of spiritual activities, that we need something new, we need something different. Prabhupada calls it a, calls it a disease. It doesn't fit anywhere. Not in spirituality, anyway. Material life has to be like that, otherwise people will, you know, 
go crazy. That's why you put them inside a house now, and they're going crazy. <laughs> put devotees in the house, and they think, well, now I got more, more ideas I can do for service. They come up with new ideas, they do different things. And they, they can, they, they're what they call, what is that word, Ec eclectic? They learn how to use the situation to, to expand the situation. And there's also some materialists who are, who are like that too, but mostly the people get tired of what they do. <laughs> and therefore change becomes natural. Okay, anything else? Thank you very much. Shimad Bhagavatam Kijaya.